My name is Maria Drobniak and I'm from the Citizens Committee for Children of New York. And I'm very happy that I'm presenting on the early care and education data, the system and just the process of making the data public. I will uh, walk you today through a couple of aspects of the uh, New York City early care and education system. So I would like to I'll tell you just briefly about the Citizens Committee for Children, for those of you who are not familiar. Then I will tell you more about the early care education system, just because it has so many components. I don't want to say it's very fragmented, but there is a lot to understand before you're able to digest the data and understand it fully. So I will spend a couple of slides on that. And then I will showcase some of the key takeaways about the ECE landscape in a city that are in some way also tied into our policy and advocacy um, priorities at the CCC. And then I will end the session by doing the demo of the data.ccc New York, our online database, and I'll focus on the EC data specifically, but I can also answer any question that come up. So for those of you who don't know, CCC has been around for more than 75 years. Uh, we are really uh, grounded in fact-based. Our advocacy and policy is really focusing on approach to child and, uh, uh, child advocacy and improving the lives of child and families across the city. Uh, and our mission is to kind of to ensure that every child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. And as you know, uh, and or, or as you will see on our site, uh, we are focusing on different domains. So it's really from economic security, housing, education, early can early care and education and that kind of approach is embedded through the data analysis component and the research through advocacy and civic engagement is, is kind of tied into these two components. So if you focus on the advocacy work of the CCC, uh, CCC has been deeply involved in early care and education policy and advocacy uh, prior to like today's date, like in 2000. 19, we did a lot of advocacy on a salary parity that you will hear more about and you will kind of understand, but really making sure that teachers who are providing, uh, like teaching in pre-K classrooms in uh, community-based organizations versus um, schools are having equal parity. Uh, so we had a huge win in 2019, but there is still work to be done. And some of the, our priorities at the moment, and with, especially with the new administration, is aging the down, down the system and providing more care for infants and toddlers, and also increasing capacity overall. So I will pause here uh, in terms of our policy and advocacy, and, and I think some things will come up as we are going through the presentation. So... When we say early care and education, I just made this slide. It's not, it's really for a lay audience to understand. We are actually talking about different things. When we think about early education, I sometimes first think about what are the types of settings that children are getting the care? Are those centers like community-based uh, centers? Are those home-based uh, child care providers? There are also schools now with the pre-K and 3K expansions who are providing child care. And we also have an uh, aspect of providing a child care through vouchers where, where your friends or relatives are, are providing the care and people are able to pay them with vouchers. So I line them up in the types of settings. And then also, if you think about funding, there is a lot of private uh, child care in, in, in the city. Obviously, at this point, I wanted to actually preface everything. I'm not focusing at the moment at the effect of the COVID on child care, which is a completely different topic, even though as we come to the data, I can say more about the declines in enrollment and uh, everything that goes with it. But there is a whole, whole universe of private care. There is also universal free care. And that is the portion that I'm focusing on uh, partially today. So these are pre-K and 3K programs. And then there is a universe of subsidized Subsidy. care. So, so it was a historically subsidized care, providing care for families of low income typically below 200% of the federal poverty level. And under that box, you see there is one box for early learn, which was historically, especially since 2012, when it was founded, city contracted subsidized care that was provided in centers and family settings. And there are also vouchers provided by ACS on HRA to use the care across contracted or private settings. And then in terms of programs, there are pre-K and 3K, as we know, really a huge expansion in the past couple of years. There is also Head Start, early Head Start that could be contracted through the city or directly with the federal government and child care, which mainly pertain to that um, subsidized, like that historically subsidized child care. So I think I said a lot on this slide, so I'll try to parse it down here a bit. Uh, there are two agencies who are... Uh, 
kind of that have oversight over the childcare system in the city. So on this left side, you see subsidized, mean tested, and I, I kind of have administration for children's services there. Prior to 2020, administration for children's services was uh, had an oversight over all early learn and has start programs, also the vouchers, either HRA or ACS. And then DOE, uh, as you know, launched and really uh, pulled that pre-K and 3K I initiative. So up until 2020, uh, that was kind of under the DOE oversight. And then in 2020, we had this transition of early learn and head start under the Department of Education because something called birth of five system is formed with the idea that one agency really has the oversight over the entire system for infants, toddlers, threes, and four-year-olds. So there's a, a lot of moving parts, but I think just for us to understand uh, in the beginning, uh, these are some of the key elements. And then, yes, on the next slide. So basically, I'll just go through a couple of pieces and I've included kind of a lot of text on like how CCC actually is making the data public. I'll just kind of try to summarize everything here and you will definitely get a slide back in the follow-up email from us. But uh, before CCC started like, uh, investing effort and it was like even before 2018 and 17 like we've always been more monitoring the system but the data available publicly is really was limited so on the administration for children's services side they published these monthly snapshots so people could see a public uh, audience could see um, like total enrollment numbers in vouchers and early learn uh, over time. However, it wasn't really broken down in any way. So we really uh, put an effort to get the data from the Administration for Children's Services with the site level data on enrollment and capacity in contracted care, early learn centers and family, and also for voucher utilization for all children. So as we know, that part of the system was providing care for children of across all age groups. And typically it was a care it would be a care that is like full day year round uh, because it's really meant to support the, the working families. So in our data set, uh, everything up to 2020, uh, you will see that from the ACS, it's data as of March in 2018 and 2019. And then in parallel, we needed to obtain the data on pre-K and 3K. And for these two years, DOE was publishing uh, in their demographic snapshots, the data on uh, pre-K and 3K enrollment in different sites, uh, in centers, in schools. There are also DOE standalone centers. Um, at that time, uh, family providers were not a part of, like they were not providing uh, pre-care, three-care services. And um, I'll say so on, on our end, there was a, a lot of data processing, geocoding, uh, making sure they're not duplicates because the demographic snapshots also included pre-K in these early learn centers. So we had to make sure that we are not counting children twice. And we did that. So on the database, we have something called all children uh, enrolled in a publicly funded uh, care as one of the indicators. Um, so post 2020, uh, we are continuing uh, our work with the ACS and getting the voucher data now only. Uh, and for the 2020, it was as of February. And then we really engaged uh, with the department, with colleagues from the Department of Education to establish the data frame that they would give to us because at the time they were not providing it publicly in the snapshots. And I would say probably there are a lot of moving pieces. Early learning transition, birth of five was established. There were two RFPs, actually several RFPs uh, post in 2000. 19. Uh, and at the same time, there was a pandemic. So I think it was a lot going on, but we really put effort to start to inform the DOE what data we need to continue to report on the system. Uh, and it took us a while and we have many colleagues there now. And I think we are getting really a very granular data. So on enrollment and capacity across all settings, we also can differentiate between uh, seats that are only school day school year and those seats who are still providing that extended care um, year around. Uh, and I think on our databases, you will see all of these kind of played out and shaped up into different indicators because there are many aspects uh, of the system. And I think this really allows us to, 
to hone in. Uh, so the latest data from the DOE, uh, we have it for school year, school year 2019-20, and we are in the process of obtaining 2020-2021 data. In the meantime, there are like on, in MMR, they published data that is more up to date, so, but it is only like citywide uh, estimates. The data that we publish on the, on the database goes down to zip code level or community district because we do get site level data and then we aggregate it by different geographies. So before I give you more data, uh, more information about how enrollment shapes up across different age groups and across different settings, I just want to remind us uh, that there are uh, over 500,000 children under five in the city, and that half of them are in a low income households. So when I was talking about that, about that subsidized portion of the system, it was meant to serve that those uh, households and children in families of low incomes. So, uh, in this last year, 2020, we have around 127,000 children enrolled in publicly funded system, which combines contracted with all these programs, pre-K, 3K, early learn, but also children under five using vouchers. And I included this map on a right side, mainly to illustrate uh, children in households below 200% of the parallel poverty level. On our database, you can find many more indicators on children Poverty in, in poverty or, or other like other uh, economic indicators, but th this is here mainly to point like where that historic need and actually historic investment because you will see on some of the maps that the highest enrollments uh, available are in these same communities, which is a good thing. But I also, since we have a half a million ch children, there is uh, the need is going beyond that and. I think on the next slides, actually, this is the one uh, I just kind of started to talk about. So if you, there is a lot on this chart. So I will just focus us here on the right side. <clears throat> These bars like showing children who are in the system around 126, 127,000 and around 400 who are not in the system. Uh, it doesn't mean they're, they're not attending any care. Some children are probably in a private care. Uh, we don't have publicly available data on children enrollment in other privately private uh, settings. But just for the sake of this conversation uh, and knowing how many children are uh, in low-income households, we can see here that majority of children are younger than uh, three and four. So infants and toddlers combined are more than 300,000. Majority of infants are not enrolled and this just tiny sliver is in a publicly funded system. At the same time, we see that four-year-olds are really those who are mainly uh, comprising the public system, and it is because of the pre-K expansion primarily. And three-year-olds as well, as you can see, they're also, some of them are in enrolled, but majority are not enrolled in a publicly funded system. Uh, and if I go here on this slide, what I'm actually uh, showing is that this whole uh, pie is a whole publicly funded system, and this part is contracted. So over 70% of all children are in contracted care, and around 36,000 uh, of children are using vouchers. And this is focusing only on children under five. And now of those who are in contracted care, <clears throat> we see that over 50% are in centers. 41% in schools and 6% in family settings. And when I was talking earlier about salary parity and the important work we've done in 2019 with the pre-king expansion, a lot of community-based teachers were teaching with a much lower salaries compared to uh, teachers in schools. So that uh, establishing the, par the parity on that level really helped st stabilize the system because teachers were leaving the centers, moving to schools, so there was a lot of movement. So it was one important uh, policy and advocacy uh, fight we had. And there is still work to be done because not everyone is still compensated equally and uh, our advocacy is, is focusing on that. And in terms of age groups, uh, more than 70% of all children in contracted are four-year-olds. Definitely pre expansion is great. And I think it's great that way more uh, children overall are getting the care, but we would like to also pay attention to infants and toddlers and these first two uh, top two bars. This chart is me trying to present how the system shaped up and changed over time. 
So we see that there was a pre-K expansion in 2014-15, and there is a huge increase with that kind of steady trend. So we have we started like in 2012 by with 33,000 children, and that it was mainly uh, children in uh, early learn. And early learn, I had this kind of dark blue part because early learn also had these pre-K seats. So it was like four-year-olds in early learn, and then it expanded. And we also see that from 2017 and 18. The 3K was introduced with 824 seats in the first year and then increased to 3,300 in 2018-19. And then what happened here in 2019-20, <clears throat> because of the transfer of the early learn system, all three-year-olds uh, kind of transfer from early learn under that kind of 3K label. So we see a drop of the gray portion of the bar of the chart, because these are now infants and toddlers who stayed and they're in the early learn. And 17,000 and entire purple part are now inclusive of three-year-olds who are in these settings. So this is like one detail. There is a lot on this chart, so I'm happy to answer any questions. But overall, I'll say now in, to in, uh, as of school year 2019-20, we are with 92,000 of children in contracted care. And there are also more recent an announcements of 3K expansion, which, which kind of started in, in specific districts. And it, th there is a plan, I think, be, uh, by 2024 to be universal. And, with, and if we, we are talking about that, we can, uh, I would like to say that um, universality in pre-K typically means around 60% of children are uh, using the care. So I think if we use that, as a benchmark for three-year-olds. But I think also the scenario is different for, di for different age groups. So universality for infants and toddlers is not the same as, th as for those of the uh, four-year-olds, for example. And speaking of infants and toddlers, <clears throat> what I'm showing on this chart, uh, the whole pie is showing 21,000 uh, infants in the city. And this side, like almost half are income eligible. 93,000. Income eligible meaning they're in households below 200% of the poverty level. The rest is not. So of those who are income eligible, we have around 7,900 enrolled, which is around 9%. 91% is not enrolled. So I was just talking about what is universality for infants. Uh, I don't think that they will all be in a child care because many parents are making the different choices, keeping children at home. But this is definitely very small numbers. And if we are talking about toddlers, it's very similar, where we have around 50,000 income eligible toddlers. <clears throat> and then of those, around 14,000 are enrolled. So I mentioned earlier that uh, with the new data we got from the DOE, uh, we are able to uh, see uh, how the to able to, to distinguish the share of seats providing full day year-round care versus uh, uh, seats providing school day and school year care. In some way, when pre-K was uh, piloted, it was kind of piloted with that school day, school year program, which is six hours and 20 minutes a day, 180 days a year. So there is no care over the summer and over the holidays. Uh, that is our I would say next and current uh, advocacy focus is really to getting more seats to provide a uh, full day year-round care and in, to support the working parents. So on this chart on the left, <clears throat> this is a whole contracted system showing that full day year-round care are around 23,000 in 2020 uh, really declined from 2018. So just in these two years, at the same time, the share of seats that are school day uh, increased. So it's uh, it started from 63.5 in 2018, and in 2020, it's 74.9. And uh, I will also say that uh, I mentioned the RFPs that the DOE put out. So the center-based uh, contracts uh, are established and started in this year, so this fall. So it will be interesting to see how the, how the RFP and how the contracts are further shaping uh, the the share of the seats available full day versus school day. And on this map, on the right, I included the community district map with children under five in full day care. And we can see it's actually very similar to that map of children in low, part, low, you know, of low income households. And uh, it is mainly because these full day year round seats are in those historically subsidized centers, though the, those 
that we used to call early learn. So on our on our database, you can also flip through the map that shows uh, school day uh, care. And then we see really many communities. All of those who are here light yellow are actually dark blue, which means almost 100% of seats, of contracted seats are uh, just a school day, school year. And this is how the same story shapes up uh, for a pre-K and 3K separately. So we see that in 3K, uh, of all students in, in pre-K, which is 67,500 in 2020, around 13% had access to these centers that provide full day year on care. 40% of centers are those that don't provide this or parents would have to pay for like extra after-school care. And 47% are in schools that also might have option for the after-school uh, care, but it is uh, for fee. Among three-year-olds, the situation is slightly different and uh, it's kind of more even. So we have 36% of three-year-olds in these centers, but it is mainly because uh, a lot of three-year-olds were kind of already enrolled in these historically subsidized uh, settings. So they are now making that higher share. But it will be interesting to see as we are having more districts, uh, uh, I mean, three came piloting in more Districts are parents making different choices and maybe enrolling children in schools or in different centers. So exactly what is driving these shifts will be interesting uh, to explore further. Uh, okay. And there is one more component that we explored in the past two years, which is really child care uh, affordability and cost burden. We use the data from the OCFS, which is a survey, but it, it really provides us the market uh, rate for infant and toddler care. It also provides the care for other age groups, but we focused on infants and toddlers on these slides. I feel like I didn't put infant and toddler, but yes, it focuses on care for infants and to toddlers, especially thinking that those are the one least presented in a system. So it means that, par that parents have to seek the private care. Uh, and here you can see that the annual uh, charge for center-based care for infants and toddlers is $18,000, $18,746. For home-based is around $10,000. And then we made something called cost burden, which is really a share of median household income for all families with young children. And citywide, it is like that cost burden for child care is 31%. And you will see on next uh, slides how it shapes up for different communities and for different household types meaning like married couples or single parents. Uh, and for home-based, because it is cheaper, uh, that burden is 17%. So it's really a share of income for family for, for family for families with at least one child under five years of age. So if you imagine that, pair, that families have two children, which is often the case, uh, that burden is even higher. And then we also have another indicator on affordability which is really share of families with at least one child under five years of age for whom care would cost more, uh, would cost no more than 7% of their income. It is really a threshold established by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And I think that it was widely used in, in planning how to make the care more universal and serve more families. So that threshold of 7%. And if you apply it on a city, we see that 93% of families with young children citywide cannot afford center-based care center-based care, which is a lot. It means it's really unaffordable across income spectrum. And this slide is showing the cost burden. So as I said, for all families, center-based is 31% and home-based care will take up the 70% of income. If you think about single parent uh, families and, and households, center-based care will take half of the income and there is also housing cost and all other costs that families are facing. And for home-based care, it is 30% of income. And on this map, we, uh, I included center, like the cost burden of the center-based care uh, for all families. And on our uh, database, you can definitely explore for uh, all family types and also for home-based and center-based. And this is similar chart. So it is affordability. We're really showing, as I said, 7% can afford <clears throat> across all families for center-based care. It is better for all families for home-based care. But again, if you think about center-based uh, care for single parents, really it's affordable only, only for 1%. And citywide is really unaffordable in all boroughs, except for Manhattan, because there are uh, 
high incomes in these com co communities because affordability is taking account the income. Uh, we can see that really uh, families in Manhattan are more able to afford the care, but the, the rest of the city is dark blue and it's showing like between zero and 3% of families are able to afford the care. And I think maybe this is a good, uh, I include two slides here on our online database, but I'm planning to uh, go live and just like demo some of these indicators, but I think it's a good moment uh, maybe to pause and take some questions, if any. You'll have these slides here as a reference, so I will for a moment stop sharing the screen. Uh, so I see a question. It is the last one. So families that are not income eligible get uh, no help from the city, state, or federal government. Uh, that is a good one. So I, I would say no in this sense, uh, because eligibility criteria, <clears throat> actually for the CAT start, it's even 100% of the federal, federal poverty level. And then it, will, it is kind of expanded because there is like a different uh, funding stream that allows funding families up to 200%. But we also know uh, from our partners and service providers that typically families who are able to get the care are really not getting to, to that threshold of 200% uh, percent of the FPL. So they're still more like lower on an income spectrum. Uh, so unless it is like through the child tax credit, like in different ways, uh, families of higher income don't get the support for the care. Um, Okay, so I see that this is early learn currently has applicants to go on a wait list. Could you talk about unmet need? <clears throat> this is really something that the CCC is going to explore throughout this year because we know that uh, we have a certain capacity and we know that in some sites uh, it's not filled like enrollment can be lower than capacity in some cases across centers or family providers. And really there is a question like why there, why the, all the seats are not filled. And I think part of it could be the location, part of it could be the process, part of it could be just that whole process of proving your income eligibility. Um, so we will engage in a qualitative project, uh, interviewing and serving parents, but also service providers to really get more information and learn like why, why we have wait lists or why we have some sites where uh, children are not enrolled and capacity is there. This is a good question. You have collected the great data here. Do you know who is using it to make decisions? So. I think the most important part, part with any data is really the users and how it is being used. So we, we, def, we track our users on a database. We are deeply, like, deeply involved with, our, uh, with the service providers, with funders, foundations. We know that city agencies are using our data to inform their work, uh, in particular the Administration for Children Services and the DOE and others. So, Data users vary. Our goal, even with this session, is just expand the word and just make sure that people know it is out there uh, and that it, it is on, a, on the website. Um, uh, open data typically provides data sets available to public by cities agencies. So we as a nonprofit don't fit that profile. Maybe there will be some changes in the future, but I think uh, at this point we are providing the, the resource and try to communicate with all stakeholders, stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I see that Dijan put a question. I see a question for someone who came in later. How did they gather the data? Were their service provided directly from your agency or through other agency that, that completes the survey? I'll just say briefly, this is not a survey data. So this is actual enrollment and capacity data uh, like provided through the Administration for Children and Services and the DOE and the data that we obtained from them and published on, on the website. So if you, uh, if you all agree, I can uh, go to our online database and just show you a couple of indicators there and kind of the best way to, uh, to use them and take a look. Okay, so... Now it's 11.35, so I think I can spend next 10 minutes here and welcome any questions. 
So this is the landing page of the database. I will deeply, I will focus on early care and education, but I want to <clears throat> make sure that you kind of know that we have these four tabs that kind of provide four different tools. One is explore data, which has indica indicators across demographic, economic conditions, housing, all these domains, including early care and education. It is 15 indicators. Then we have a tab on rank communities by risk, which is really featuring our child and family well-being index, uh, which is pulling 18 specific indicators to, com com to, to create the index and uh, compare communities across uh, among each other. So the tool is here. Uh, I'll scroll down briefly. You will ha you have able to see the data via table and also to browse through di different domain domains that actually are making up the risk ranking. The third tool is map community resources where we really are trying to combine that's really story of data which is very often showing inaccessibility or uh, or issues in the communities with strengths so these are the assets that communities have we get this data also from pu publicly available sources like city agencies state agencies they are uh, broken down under these same domains economic security housing so if i scroll down to education you can see that I have contracted child care, early learn, non-contracted voucher, pre-K sites, 3K sites, and like additional breakdowns, like sites in the schools, in pre-K centers, in CBOs. And if, you, if I scroll down, you have youth, other school programs, family, and community. So there is a lot there. On each of these tabs, you're able to download a raw data. Like in this case, you're able to download a CSV file, locations. We don't provide addresses or contact numbers because the, the whole purpose of the tool is really to co uh, compare assets and uh, availability of those across communities and like compare them to the need and where the needs are. So like if I'm on education domain, for example, I can go under graduation rates and it will populate the map and then I can overlay any asset here with that data. And the last one is create location profiles, where you can actually pick your community and pick the data that you would like, and then have a profile just for that particular community, like, for example, community district, and then the indicators of your choice. And then you have a, a, a report on that. But I will come back here and explore data and just uh, showcase as well that in addition to browsing through indicators by hovering over the domains, you can also filter by location or demographic. So you can see that all of our data, most of them are available by community district. We do have some data available by zip code, a new feature that we piloted um, two, two years ago. We have data also available by school district. And as you can see, uh, not many indicators are here because I clicked also on health and mental health. So if I click out of there, of there you'll see that school district are mainly education indicators. Zip code, we have way more than it was showing before. Uh, early care and education indicators are those that we also are publishing by zip code. There is data by police precinct, etc. And then in terms of demographics, we are highlighting data available by race, ethnicity. I'll click out of this one. Age groups, gender, etc. And you can always search by keyword here. And then, for example, infant. So it will bring up infant. Uh, mortality, but it will bring up also many of the early care education indicators because we are talking about infants enrolled in this in, in this uh, in these uh, settings. So I will go over to this indicator on uh, enrollment in publicly funded child care for children under five, just so you can see how one of these indicators actually is looking and what is it that you can do on an online database. So there are three ways that we are showing the data. One is via map. It is community district map in this case. You also have option to overlay other districts. It is also a feature we piloted two years ago. So if you want to see how city council district overlay uh, in relation to community districts, and then you zoom in, then you can see that. You also have option to view the data as a table. So whatever was selected on a map will show up here in a table format. If I click on this breakdown by age group, you will have a table that shows you how many cities, how many children are enrolled by age groups, and then for uh, five boroughs and all community districts. And the third visual available on a database is really bar chart. So I'll 
check all age groups. So we can see the summaries for this city as a whole. And we can also add, for example, a borough, or we can add any community that we would like to compare the data. So for example, Astoria. So we see number of children by age groups in Astoria versus Queens versus city. This can be helpful just as a screenshot or you can download or print the page and include it in any document that, that you are creating. And I will also point while I'm here on this source section uh, and definitions uh, at the end, because for every indicator we have data on sources and we kind of further de define the data if needed. So, um, so on enrollment in publicly funded cares, this is that number that I'm, I'm currently showing data for 2019 because I did not produce the data for 2020 by zip code yet, but I think it's helpful actually to be able to go between two, two geographies. And in addition to age groups, you can break these numbers by setting. So we have center, family, informal, and school. I think in the presentation I included and I said that the standalone uh, DOE pre-K centers are counted as a school along with other school types, public school types. And I do have all of that in, uh, in sources and notes. I think I do, yeah. Schools mean district schools, including public charter, special education, and standalone pre-K centers. And then additional way to check the things is really age group by settings because uh, it really came up important especially for providers and for those who are trying to understand uh, the, the state of uh, EC in their co community how many infants are enrolled in centers versus how many infants are in family care or informal child care and then the same thing is available for each age group so the similar layout is for enrollment in contract contracted care where you have all these breakdowns. An additional one is length of care that I was I included in the map. So basically this is whole contracted care. So these are the full day here around uh, availability. And this is school day. So you can see the darkest blue, I'll put a, use the percent. So between 92% to 100% of all contracted seats are school day, uh, school year only as is the case, like in most of the Queens, Staten Island, and these Manhattan communities. And I also broken down this same indicator, but in a slightly different way, by age groups. So this is length of care by age group for four-year-olds versus three-year-olds, toddlers, and infants. But toddlers and infants are only in full day care, so th there is no distinction between the two. <clears throat> And I can scroll down here a bit. So I show you this one and contracted care. There are also indicators on subsidized care, which combines early learn portion and uh, vouchers. Uh, there is also indicator just on early learn. And then we have those on vouchers for children under five versus vouchers for all children. Uh, the indicator on unmet need for publicly funded care is available by Boro. And that is because we've broken it down by different age groups, as you saw in that chart in the presentation. But really, when you uh, dive deeper on the community district level and focusing just on infants, there is really high margin of error in the census data in how many children are in these communities. That's why we produce this analysis uh, by Boro, but it really gives us that general picture. And for infants and toddlers, we have a data on entire population, those who are income eligible, those who are eligible and in publicly funded system and those who are income eligible and not in publicly funded system. So the same thing is available for toddlers and for three and four year olds slightly different because we didn't take into account income eligibility because pre-K is universal. There is one question we always uh, would like to know is like of all children in pre-K, for example, how many uh, of them would be uh, falling under that income eligibility uh, criteria? versus not, but DOE is not collecting that information. The program is universal, so we don't have that. But I think this general overview is uh, is interesting. And I will, it's 11.45, so I will end with showing one of these like cost burden indicator that, that you saw in a slide deck. So we have it broken down for centers and for home base. So this map is showing center-based for all families, but also if we 
scroll down to single parents uh, and cost burden it costs, we see that in some communities it goes over 156, like if we just take uh, into account uh, the income. So it's really unaffordable altogether. And then we had the same overview on the home-based settings. Um, I feel like I shared a lot <laughs> about the database. Uh, I'll just point again that raw data in this case uh, is downloading the CSV files. So you have it for each individual indicators and you have the data by community district there so you can use it further for any analysis. Uh, you have more about keeping track where we are advising uh, users how to cite the data. We provide uh, information on sources for the assets because unlike for the data on site here, uh, indicators, we don't have other place at the moment uh, to really say uh, from what data sources the assets are coming. So about is the place to take a look at that. Um, and you have Bijans, uh, he's Associate Executive Director for research. His email is here. You can always email me uh, or anyone else on, on our team uh, with any questions. So I'll stop sharing the screen so we can have some time for any questions or discussion. Um, I see the question, are student parents enrolled in private university without income still ineligible for subsidized care? Uh, 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 I'm thinking now, student parents enrolled in private university. Uh, I would assume that maybe this same student parents could be uh, eligible for the Medicaid, like in terms of the health insurance. Uh, maybe I can just check with my uh, colleagues on our policy and advocacy team and get back to you. I think that would be a better way to answer as we're not like steeply involved in like all these el eligibility criteria. but I'll be happy to Take your name down and just be in touch. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on the new initiative to provide businesses with childcare tax credit? I think I have my colleague Jack here, so I don't know if you want to uh, share more about this. Thanks, Maria. I'm actually not too familiar with, with this proposal. Um, okay. It's another one that we, we might be able to bring to Rebecca Charles, our colleague who uh, leads policy in childcare, and we can... Um, return with an answer for you, Eden. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. One thing that I'll add is that even if there is a proposal to provide businesses with child care tax credit, we also want families to receive a child care tax credit. That's true. Yeah, definitely. Um, with the effect of the pandemic on the economics for the city poor, does looking at 2018 gives us a good view? As I said, uh, the data like on the on the site is like up to 2020, which is still uh, before the pandemic, just because of the data that it is uh, reported. Uh, we looked at the data citywide that is provided in the MMR and other agencies' uh, reports, and we do see uh, like a decline in pre-K enrollments, also in vouchers, early learn. So definitely that is something that as we get new data, we'll be able to say more and compare more how it played out across different communities or across uh, for different types of families. <clears throat> so I'll say definitely data pre-pandemic. It's showing actually a lot. It's not showing the pandemic effect. There are many uh, sites closures, like many issues in the childcare sector altogether. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that even before the pandemic, we did see these disparities in access, in availability of site, unaffordability, and also just uh, uh, unavailability of care for all age groups uh, in, a, in a way that it is like available for four-year-olds. And even if I say that care is available for four-year-olds, there are many issues within that system. Like are all families using it? We, are, we know like... Um, that in some cases, family prefers some more culturally appropriate spaces, or maybe they really need full day year round care. Maybe they're not taking part of the in a pre case. So I think there are many uh, issues like within every segment of the system that could be ex explored separately. How challenging, is it, uh, how challenging is it to capture the data around children in homeless shelters? 
I think it is challenging on many uh, on many aspects, and I think for many different data sources. And like in this in this particular case, we are not getting uh, a distinction or any information if the children are in homeless shelters. Um, Jack, there is anything that you should add? Yeah, I was going to say maybe this is an area where I can provide a little yeah. bit of an answer. Um, they, I mean, obviously, we have a sense from the Department of Homeless Services uh, overview of its daily census report that can give us a sense of the number of children under 18. I'm sharing the link there if you want to take a look at the latest number. It's about 15,000, just under 15,000 children under 18 uh, in total who are staying in uh, city-run shelters. Uh, but then, and we also know then from its annual reports that many of those children are under the age of five, but we do not get direct information on, you know, whether they're enrolled in family-based care or centers or, you know, informal care uh, from there. I mean, we also get a sense from the mayor's management report, a separate source that will tell us the, you know, the share of children in shelters who are enrolled in schools that are in the same district or the same borough as the shelter where they're located. Um, and in many cases, that's very low, requiring children uh, and their families and the students to travel very far uh, from the, the, the shelter that they're placed in to the school that they're attending. Um, and then we know across the, the broader education system, uh, more from grades from pre-K through through 12, that there's still more than 100,000 students uh, across New York City in temporary housing that may be in shelter, but it may also be many cases of uh, students who are staying temporarily with uh, another family doubled up in a situation where uh, it's more than one family in one apartment. Uh, but this is a situation where, you know, the kind of qualitative work that CCC does that Maria has alluded to uh, is also something that we're looking to explore to engage directly with uh, families staying in shelter to get a better sense uh, at the local level and really uh, a more qualitative picture of what it is like to, to raise children who, who require child care um, while staying in the shelter system, too. Thank you, Jack. And I think another thought, like all this time we are talking about the care, care either school day or year around full day, but there are many families, as we know from our other qualitative work, that really are working non-traditional hours. So even eight to six child care is not something that works for them. That is something that we don't have like a full grasp on. We just know that it is uh, an issue across many communities. And as we know, like many industries like uh, hospitality, and retail are really using like different hours and people are, especially in the low income communities, are employed in these jobs. So how they uh, get the care, uh, it's, I feel like a completely other unknown or area that city should be paying attention on, attention to. Uh, I'm very happy that we had this presentation today and that you're all here. And we, in our follow-up follow -up email, we will include this presentation and also some other fact sheets and, and the reports we, we produced over the past couple of years on ECE, so you can kind of have a broader scope of our work in this area. And always feel free to email us with any specific or more broad questions.